Hello and welcome to this film which is all about patterns in the periodic table. Um, having introduced uh, the periodic table in the first film, what we're going to do now is we're going to start um, talking about things called atomic and ionic radius and electronegativity and first ionization energy and we're going to see if we can use the concept of core charge to explain why we observe the patterns that we do for these three properties as we move around in period three. Okay, so as I say, before we try and explain how these patterns vary, um, we'll have a look at what we mean by these terms. Now, if we treat an atom as a sphere, then the radius of that sphere will be the atomic radius. If you look at this picture here, um, all the grey spheres, which have been cut away in some cases, they are the atoms, and all the red spheres here are positive ions and all the blue spheres here are negative ions. So you can see that for any atom that loses electrons the ion is smaller or has a smaller ionic radius than the atom did Okay, because it's lost electrons. For any atom that gains electrons the ionic radius is larger than the atomic radius because those electrons have been gained so the atom got bigger. Okay, so that's what we mean by atomic and ionic radius. Let's have a quick look at what we mean by electronegativity. Now, this is a kind of relative scale which we'll look at a bit more later. We'll have a, we'll see how this varies amongst the elements in the periodic table. Um, but it's important to know the definition of it, which is that it is a measure of the strength of attraction between an atom and the electrons in a covalent bond. Now. It's important that you can find atoms that make covalent bonds if you're going to measure how strongly they attract electrons in those covalent bonds. So there are some atoms that we don't have um, electronegativities for because there are some atoms we've never found in covalent bonds. Okay, And you'll see later that, that in particular talks, uh, we're talking here about the noble gases because they very rarely form compounds at all. Okay, So there are some atoms which you can't measure an electronegativity for. And finally, um, we're going to talk about how first ionization energy varies across period three. So here's what it means again. You should be familiar with this. It's the energy required to remove an electron from every atom in one mole of gaseous atoms. So we're forming gaseous one plus ions from gaseous atoms. So another way of defining this would be to say that we're forming one mole of gaseous one plus ions from one mole of gaseous atoms. Okay, and it's important that you can write equations for these things, as we discussed in the bonding topic. Right, if we're going to try and explain why these things vary the way they do, we're going to need to talk about something called core charge. Now, first of all, how do we find core charge? It's a very, very simple sum. It's the total number of electrons minus the number of inner shell electrons. So I could do this for magnesium, perhaps, which has two electrons in its first shell, 8 in its second and 2 in its third, so 12 electrons in total. But of those 12, 10 are in inner shells, so that leaves 2 as its core charge. Okay, And you could figure out, hopefully quite easily, that that number shouldn't change as we move down group 2. Okay. If you look at group 7, say, if we look at fluorine and chlorine, let's actually compare these two. Okay, so where there's fluorine 27 and chlorine 287, we can see that the number of inner shell electrons in fluorine is 2. If you subtract that from its total of 9, then you're left with a core charge of 7. Do the same thing for chlorine. You subtract these 10 from its total of 17, and you're left with a core charge of 7. Now, why is this important? Well, if we consider the attraction between these outer shell electrons, which if you think about it, all these things are basically measuring. So the atomic radius, the electronegativity, the ionization energy, they're all talking about the outermost electrons, the furthest one from the nucleus, right? Because they're the ones we're either removing or measuring when we measure a radius. If we think about the attraction between them and the nucleus, that's going to depend partly on the nuclear charge, so how many protons there are in the nucleus, but also on something called shielding, or in other words, the way that inner shell electrons shield outer shell electrons from the nuclear charge. So these two electrons will kind of be blocking the positive charge of the nucleus from these seven outer shell electrons. 
Okay, so if we think about how many protons there are in fluorine, well, there's nine because it's element number nine. Chlorine is element number 17, so there's 17 protons. So although the atomic number has gone up by eight, the number of inner shell electrons has also gone up by eight, and because they repel those outer shell electrons, they basically cancel out this increase in the number of protons. All right? So in other words, the shielding has increased by eight, if you like. Right? Outer shell electrons don't shield other, shell, other outer shell electrons from nuclear charge, so we only need to consider the inner ones. So basically, to cut a long story short, core charge doesn't change within a group. It increases as you move a, uh, along a period, and it basically measures effectively how much charge those outer shell electrons see from the nucleus, bearing in mind that the nucleus might be a different size and that inner shell electrons will repel outer shell electrons. Right. Now, bearing in mind what our definition or what, our, what this idea of concept of core charge is, let's try and explain how the atomic and ionic radius vary. And with, as with all these patterns, not this one only, but with ionization energy and electronegativity too, what we're going to try and do every time is to consider core charge and the number of shells. Okay, so if we move across a period, so here we are in, in period three, sodium, magnesium, aluminium, sulfur, and chlorine. Okay, what's happening to the atomic, remember that's the gray sphere, what's happening to the atomic radius as we move across that period? Well, the core charge is going up, so the electrons are feeling more nuclear charge. What's happening to the number of shells? Well, nothing, because they've all got three shells. Okay, so in other words, all the outer shell electrons are in the same shell, but that shell is getting drawn closer and closer to the nucleus because the core charge is increasing. So across a period, we should expect to see atomic radius shrinking. Okay, same thing with the ionic radius for the positive ones, but then suddenly when we get to the negative ones, they jump up because they're gaining electrons. Okay, what would happen down a group? Well, down a group, the core charge doesn't change. Remember, it stays the same. So in other words, if I move down group one, the core charge isn't changing, the number of shells is increasing all the time. So those outer shell electrons will be getting further and further from the nucleus because they effectively feel the same amount of charge, but they're in more and more distant shells. Okay, so the atomic radius increases as we go down a group. If we look at electronegativity, and on this periodic table we're shown all the electronegativities of all the different elements. These red ones are the most electronegative elements, and in particular, fluorine is the most electronegative element of all of them. It's given an electronegativity of 4, and cesium down here has the lowest electronegativity of 0.7. Okay. What's happening to the core charge and number of shells as we go across a period? Well, the core charge is going up. The number of shells isn't changing, so the outer shell electrons or the electrons in a covalent bond will be more strongly attracted to the nucleus, so the electronegativity ought to rise as we go across a period. right? If you remember that fluorine is the most electronegative element, then you know that going from left to right, you're going up. And as you're also remembering that fluorine is the most electronegative element, electronegative element, then it must be falling down a group because fluorine at the top of its group is the, has the highest electronegativity. Why should it fall down a group? Well, because the core charge doesn't change as you go down a group, but the number of shells does. Okay, The further your electrons are from the nucleus, the less strongly they'll be pulled towards the nucleus if they're core charge is staying the same. So the electronegativity, or how strongly they're pulled towards the nucleus in a covalent bond, that will fall as you go down a group. And lastly, if we look at first ionization energy as we go across the period. Now this graph has actually got quite a lot of information on it. Okay, This is moving across the first two periods. right? Sorry, not the first two, but the second and third. All right. So the green ones are period three, sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, blah, blah, blah. So we're going across the period here, and what we can see is that there's a general rise in the first ionization energy. Right? That's because the core charge is increasing, so the electrons are experiencing more nuclear charge, and the number of shells is staying the same. So they're all in the same shell, but they're experiencing more nuclear charge, so it's harder to remove them from the atom, and it's 
in other words requires more energy to do that okay going down a group you can see that period 3 is always lower than period 2 so that means that the ionization energy falls as you go down the group much like electronegativity because the core charge stays the same but the number of shells increases all the time so because the electrons are effectively seeing the same nuclear charge but they're further and further from the nucleus it becomes easier and easier to remove them notice there are some little blips here and we've looked in the bonding topic at how we explain uh, sorry in the atomic structure topic at how we explain those in terms of the partially filled subshells okay we're not really looking at that too much here okay quite a lot of information covered there I suppose one of the most complex things that we looked at and it was quite quick was the concept of core charge and hopefully you can use that to explain how these three key things um, vary as we go not only across periods but also up and down groups in the periodic table if there's anything you'd like to ask about or comment on please feel free to post a comment on YouTube or to come and see me and to talk about those things face to face